has the Old Testament been copied faithfully and carefully so we can trust our current Bibles? How do we know we have the right books of the Old Testament? Well, these are two big questions we're going to explore today with our guest, Dr. John Mead, an Old Testament scholar and the author of an excellent new book called Scribes and Scripture. John, we've had you on. Thanks for coming back. Hey, thanks again, Sean. Always a joy. Well, we're going to jump into the Old Testament, but before we get to some of these tough questions, I'm really curious. You spent your life studying the Old Testament. Where did you get your love for the Old Testament from? Yeah. Well, very quickly, I, I've always enjoyed history. Uh, I probably grew up in churches that, of course, preached the New Testament more than the Old. <laughs> but but I've always enjoyed just what led up to Jesus, what led up mm. to the New Testament. The New Testament talks about fulfillment. So I just thought, well, fulfilling what, you know? And uh, so, yeah, just kind of from the Bible itself early on is how I got my love for the Old Testament. So either somebody who studies the Old Testament historically, like we're going to get into questions of canonicity and textual criticism, or even some of the jarring stories in the Old Testament, which are for another video, like, for example, some of the violence. Did you have a moment as a Christian or an OT scholar where you stopped and thought, wait a minute, the Bible didn't just float out of heaven. There's some genuine difficult questions we have to wrestle with here. And how did you respond? Yeah, good. So I'm from the Northeast, uh, which is predominantly a Roman Catholic area. Uh, my grandmother on my, uh, my, my dad's mom was a nominal Roman Catholic as I was growing mm. up. And uh, so it was actually from a young age, I saw like a thicker Bible right on her mm. bookshelf and uh, a Bible that, of course, contained seven more books than was in mine. So, so I think kind of there, I, I, there's no crisis of faith there. It's just kind of innocent. But, uh, but, but over the years, just kind of looking at, okay, no, there really are differences here. But it wasn't probably until uh, Bible college days at Columbia International University or so, uh, seminary days at Southern Seminary, when we're in exegesis classes, mm -hmm. really having to wrestle with, uh, textual variants in the Old Testament. I probably like mo most of your listeners here. I think most people just think the Old Testament came down to us pretty buttoned up, and there really aren't a lot of textual variants. There, you know, you read the New Testament, you get the the ending of the Gospel of Mark problem, right? Everyone, al almost everyone, I should say, knows about that, but say very few people know about some of the issues in the Old Testament. Uh, so anyways, it wasn't until I had professors picking and prodding me saying, hey, what do you do about this or that? And mm -hmm. that's when you, you kind of come to it. But in that setting, it's a great place to be uh, confronted with those sorts of questions because uh, you're surrounded by real experts uh, who can uh, help you walk through them and, and sort through them and things like that. So, well, I appreciate you tackling the tough issues and doing good scholarship behind it. And we're going to dive in. So this first question um, is massive. I mean, it's huge. When we talk about how the Bible, the Old Testament was originally written down from Moses to the prophets, right? <laughs> Thousand plus years or whatever it is. Maybe mm -hmm. it just gives people who don't know the process just some principles and insights about how the Bible was first written down in that period. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's appropriate to start with the alphabet. Okay, so hmm. since the late 1800s, um, we have known, uh, I and mean, maybe even before that, we've known about Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? We weren't able to crack that language until much later. We knew about Mesopotamian writing in cuneiform or wedges, you know, but again, these languages didn't begin to really be cracked until about the 1800s, okay, and, and the late 1800s at that. Um, and then from there, it, it was a study of like, when did the alphabet come into existence? That is, how did we get our English alphabet, right? And, uh, and scholars, you know, have tried to sort through this question, but it really, again, hasn't been till the 20th century where real data points uh, of the, uh, the history of the alphabet have started to come together. So probably in most textbooks, you read about the Phoenicians inventing the alphabet mm -hmm. around the ninth century BC, okay? Well, yeah, no, probably not. The Phoenicians now we, we could think about as those as, as a people who inherited an alphabet. 
okay? okay? Right now, the consensus of scholarship has the uh, invention of the alphabet in Egypt, and we can date it to about 1900, 1800 BC. Wow. Okay. Is the first real concrete evidence of what we might call the linear alphabet. That is not hieroglyphic and not cuneiform. And from there, now, major discoveries showing not just uh, writing on a piece of stone, but but now like from Thebes uh, in this, uh, this ostracon discovered at Thebes a few years ago, um, there's not only like uh, alphabet, like a, a scribe learning how to write the letters of the alphabet, but little hieroglyphic mnemonic devices so that he could remember the alphabet. It actually, it actually shows archaeologists and scholars that that there's uh, uh, not just an alphabet, but but a learning to write the alphabet. You see, uh, and this is dated to about 1500 BC. Okay. okay. And uh, so, whatever, so lots and lots of evidence. There, there are what we call um, abecedaries or abecedaries uh, in Israel itself, starting at places like uh, Isbet Sarda around 1200 BC, where some scribe has written out on a piece of clay all the letters of the alphabet. You see, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, so you have to start with the history of the alphabet. What were they writing with? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so Moses, I think we can talk about as writing with an alphabet. I don't think we have to talk about Moses writing with cuneiform, okay, or, yeah. or hieroglyphics, but actually writing with the alphabet. And um, so I think Moses can write the Pentateuch. I think there's little changes, though, that we should be aware of um, because it's not just so simple. OK, OK, uh, let me just give like a concrete example. And, and we sure. do mention this in this one in the book. But in Genesis 14, 14, when uh, Abram is chasing after the kings of the east, he's chasing uh, them to, to get Lot and his family members back. It says that he chased them as far north as Dan. And and for those of us who know a little bit of Old Testament history, we know that Dan is like a great great grandson of Abraham. <laughs> and so so how does it how does it work that Abram that the narrator can say that Abram ran as far as Dan because Dan uh, is not even a glimmer in his mom's eye yet at this point, and and even further out there's, there's not a place name called Dan. Well, the the Bible itself actually gives us the insight into this when you look at Judges eighteen twenty nine. There's a reference to the place Dan, but there's a little scribal note that's in the text itself. You can go read it yourself. That says, now Dan used to be called Laish. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yeah. And so what we can maybe surmise from this is that the scribe of Genesis 14 has updated the place name Laish to the place name Dan. So that his contemporary audience knows which direction Abraham chased after the Eastern Kings from, okay, or two. So anyways, that's just a simple example. There are maybe a, a handful of places like this in the Pentateuch. Uh, another one we talk about is, you know, Moses probably didn't write about his own death at the end of De the book of Deuteronomy. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so mainly, right, I say Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And then we can talk about all the other books written down by prophets. Now, some of this is pretty obvious, like Isaiah, right? Uh, the vision of Isaiah. I know there are scholarly questions about who and who, how many Isaiahs there were and these sorts of things. Sure. But in any case, we, we definitely have uh, the vision of Isaiah referenced, right, in Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, we can do this with most of what we call the writing prophets. But but I'm still t teasing out a reference. This is going to maybe be a little bit circular. But, but you've got Josephus, a later historian that we're going to talk about a lot uh, here later on. Josephus talks about 13 books written by prophets, Sean. 13 books being written by prophets. Well, this is kind of an odd number. And scholars have been puzzled by how Josephus can come to this, uh, this conclusion that prophets wrote down, say, the history books. But there's been some good scholarship done on this. If you look at First Chronicles 29, 29, for example, what you get is after the death of David, uh, the chronicler actually lists the prophets who were responsible for writing down the acts and deeds of David. So it mm -hmm. talks about how the seer Samuel 
wrote down some of the deeds of David or the seer or the, the prophet Nathan, right? The famous Nathan who confronts mm -hmm. him after his sin with Bathsheba is also said to be responsible for writing down the acts and deeds of David, but he's a prophet. And interestingly, Gad, uh, much lesser known, we know little about him, but Gad uh, also is said to have written down the acts and deeds of David, you see. And actually, for most of the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms, we can actually see from the books of Chronicles which prophets were responsible for writing down their acts and deeds. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. So, so all that to say, there seems to be eyewitness accounts, live accounts of uh, the acts and deeds of Israel's and Judah's, later on the southern kingdom's kings, okay, being recorded. So I take those references seriously, actually. I, I think we can talk about prophets writing these things down. Now, there's, of course, though, we have to come back and say there's a whole lot of work done by anonymous scribes. And we talk about these in the book uh, quite a bit. And archaeology, like I've referenced earlier, has done a great service in showing us good scribal work and activity. And what, what, what's interesting about it is you have the palace as a place where scribes are working. You have the temple where scribes are working. But now archaeology has shown us like little trading posts or military outposts called Kantilat Ajrud you know, established in like the ninth century BC, also showing scribal work, not just writing, but perhaps a scribe learning how to write, like specifically learning how to write his alphabet hmm. and specifically learning how to write letters. Because in this, in this particular place in the land, he might need to engage in some military correspondence. And this scribe needs to learn how to write a letter. Makes okay, sense. interestingly enough. Yeah. And some scholars like Bill Schneiderwind uh, have, have gone even further to say that on some of the texts discovered at Cantilodage Rood, we can even detect uh, the handwriting of a master scribe over and against the handwriting of a student scribe learning to write his ABCs. Okay. So now, not everyone accepts uh, Professor Schneiderwind's uh, conclusions, but but it's but it's really really interesting and and uh, and and definitely some food for thought there. But if that's the case, what that shows is that in the land of Israel, there's been a scribal culture, that is a mm. a, a, a culture in which we can learn to read and write, and where those crucial disciplines for any civilization are being passed down, right, generation to generation, as it were. And and there's no biblical. We'll talk about this in a minute. But there's no biblical manuscripts or texts from this period. We simply don't have any material copies of Old Testament books from this period. But scholars are little by little, patiently piecing together the narrative for how scribes worked and okay. operated during this time. So, how are the books written? I think there were authors, and then there were also scribes that were transmitting these books. You know, little by so little. Tell me, tell me if this is fair in some. We know there's a, an alphabet long or significantly before the time of Moses, so that objection has been removed. You For have sure. this people group, and all the records believe they've been given the words of God and treasure them. We see yes. this scribal culture built in from the beginning and references to who these prophets were passing it down. Even though right. we don't have the originals, that gives us reason as a whole to trust this process. Is that a fair summary? To totally. And okay. uh, totally. And and we're going to say much more once yeah. we get to when our earliest evidence surfaces, Sean. The earliest evidence also shows a very well preserved text. Okay. So, yeah. gotcha. We'll, we'll get to that. So, yes. you had you had a statement in your book, and I'll be honest, it slightly surprised me, so I want you to qualify it. <laughs> Only okay. because in the world of academia, one of the things they tell us is not to overstate our case. And because I right. love what I do and believe in it, I'll be honest, I catch myself at times going, yeah, maybe I need to qualify that a little bit. <laughs> in the book, this is a direct quote. You said, through the discipline of textual criticism, we can have a high degree of certainty as to the content of the original Old Testament manuscripts. Now, this is not my lane. I would probably say a high degree <laughs> of confidence I don't know if I'd say right. certainty. 
So tell yeah. me if A, you would qualify yeah. that, or B, if I'm wrong and why. Yeah, no, I, I, I think con- confidence is good, and and probably the rest of the unpacking of that statement in that chapter probably does lead more to high degree of confidence, mm. um, high degree of probability. Um, okay. We do we do stress probability quite a bit, you but do. when you're thinking about eccentric circles of certainty. Um, that is the further the things furthest out being less certain, right? And the things further in being certain. For me, as I look at the scope and swath of our manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, I think it's a far more certain picture, okay? Than what some are going to say and say, no, 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 no. We're 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 guessing because of the chaotic situation that the that the manuscripts gotcha. show. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so it's a, it's a, in some sense, it's a relative statement. Okay. Um, but I, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe overstating there just for effect because I want people to, because re- <laughs> okay. I want people to, because I want people to realize, okay, mm. there's real, there's actually real reason to believe that, mm. uh, that we've got a well, well preserved text here. Yeah. Fair enough. So you would say that a lot of the scholarly community has gone too far being skeptical and you're just trying to pull it back. Oh, for sure. Statement. Okay, that's exactly right. Now, I'm really, I'm really curious to jump into the Old Testament scribes, and I could be wrong about this one, but I think probably my father's done as much or more than anybody over the past half century to popularize who the Masoretic text and the copying process by which they would copy scripture from one generation to the next. Now, in like in evidence and some of his talks, etc. Help yes. us understand what is the Masoretic period, what's the Masoretic text, and what role does that play in our modern Bibles? Yeah, okay, let me just start with the last one first. So um, the Masoretic text, I would say, is the dominant textual tradition that our English Bibles are based on. Okay, okay. So, so let's just get that right out of the way. Uh, it's the text that gr- most influences our English translations. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's immediate relevance there. Okay, now the dates on the Masoretic text proper is 9th century AD up until basically, I don't know, 1200 AD or, or even beyond, really up to the printing press. It begins around the 9th century AD. Now, this is confusing to some. That, what we're talking about are the manuscripts in Hebrew that contain... Hebrew consonants and Hebrew vowels mm-hmm. in pointings and little dashes. Okay, so we, what we're really talking about is the text that the Masoretes received and mm. augmented with vowels. Okay, the, the, the consonantal text goes way back before the Masoretes, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the Masoretic text proper is that text that has uh, a conservative rendering of the consonants, the traditional reading of those consonants with vowels written in. Okay, and then also it has what we call the Masora, which is a full catalog of uh, scribal notations. Okay, sometimes like the Masoretes will tell you like when you've hit the the middle verse of a book. Okay, like they're they're pretty precise. Okay, yeah. they've they've counted all that off. All right, and uh, and sometimes they record little textual variants here or there, uh, differences between how the text is written, between uh, versus say how the text is being read uh, in the synagogue. You know these kinds of things. Uh, just a quick example of that for those who may not be aware. So uh, there, the Tetragrammaton, Yod Hey Wow Hey Yahweh right? Maybe Jehovah, right? Some might recognize. Uh, but long before that name, that, that name stopped being pronounced, okay? And it was started, it started to be uh, rendered with a surrogate of Adonai, or Lord or Master. This is what we call a perpetual Kathiv Kare. They would always write the tetragram, yod Hey wow Hey. <laughs> but when every time they reached it in six, seven thousand places in the Old Testament, they would simply read Adonai, okay, or something like that. They would never actually try to pronounce the name. So, so that's an example of a Kathib Kare that the Masoretes preserved, you see, in the manuscripts that uh, 
that go back to them. So the Masoretic text begins in the ninth century. Uh, and there we start to see vowels being rendered, consonantal text being untampered with, right? They just simply continued to record what was given to them. Okay. Super helpful. So this is where some of the teaching, again, I remember hearing my dad as a young kid, it was like three mistakes in a manuscript was typically all that was allowed. <laughs> they would count the number of consonants letter by letter, come to the name of God, get a new pen. That's where some of these strict Old Testament practices come yeah. from, roughly yes. ninth century, and then yes. preserving it, adding uh, vowels. Now, of course, that's, right. that's remarkable, but that raised the question, okay, that's eight, 900 years removed from the time of Jesus, 1,200 yes. or 1,400 years, obviously, depending on how you date the Exodus from Moses, there's still a massive period of transition. So yes. let's move back a little closer to dates and see what we know about those scribes. And that gets us to what in the book you call the silent period, which is really the 3rd to the 8th centuries AD. How was the Bible yes. copied then? What uh, evidence right. do we have? Yeah, great. Okay. So so let me just quickly describe this. So we have 3rd to 8th century AD, just a, a relative handful of fragments of manuscripts. Though, interestingly, archaeology is discovering more and more. Mm. Uh, there is now, uh, from that 7th, 8th century, uh, fragments now, so fragments, but from all five books of the Torah that scholars are convinced— actually belong to the same Torah scroll, okay, which is really interesting. Uh, so they're not, notice I'm still saying scroll here. Jews are not yet copying in a codex or a book. That comes much later even. These, mm -hmm. this is, these are fragments from a scroll from about the 7th, 8th century. So, so those, those fragments, but then uh, in the 8th, 9th century, we get a massive discovery, Sean, called the Cairo Geniza. So the old synagogue in Cairo, Egypt, had a Geniza or a storage room where, where Jewish uh, leaders and scribes had been storing used up manuscripts, manuscripts no longer uh, seen fit to uh, be used for the public reading of the, of the Hebrew scriptures. And so they just kept storing them away in this storeroom called the Geniza. Well, scholars found this in the, in the 19th, uh, well, 20th century. Okay. And, and, and that just shed a, a lot of light on what the text of the Old Testament looked like, even what the Hebrew language was looking like through the Middle Ages. I mean, there are some 24,000 wow. fragments of the Bible discovered at the Cairo Geniza. Okay, there's a massive cache of manuscripts that we're still sifting through, to be honest, but we can date them. They're all dated to say eighth, ninth century and up. Okay, so, okay. so they don't go back much earlier from what, from what I can tell. Now, uh, then you have the silent period, third to eighth century, but the reason why they start that silent period at the third century AD is because that's the period of when the Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts cease. OK, the Romans kicked the Jews out of the land finally by 132 A.D. And from that point on, scholars cease to date uh, D uh, Dead Sea Scrolls right to, to after that date. So mm. the silent period then begins third eighth century. And we do have little snippets of what we would call the Masoretic text without the vowels. OK, the technical term for this is the proto Masoretic text. All of these fragments of text from the third to eighth century point to the later Masoretic text. That is, Jews are conservatively copying the text, or, or that, that one tradition of the text, I should say, all the way up to the period of the Masoretes. Okay. But that silent period, we have precious little evidence of it. But all the evidence we have points in the direction that Jews were just conservatively copying the text. Okay. We have a Torah scroll. We have some evidence from Kings, Job, I think. Uh, and maybe a prophetic book or two, if I remember right. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. Mm. But what we have shows that's how the text was being copied, letter for letter. And it's the text that the Masoretes eventually received in the ninth century. Okay, so I hope that, I hope that helps. Okay, so when you say copied conservatively, we don't have as much evidence as we do for the Masoretic period in terms of fragments, scrolls, etc., but right. the sparse pieces that we do have – 
as a whole tell the narrative that there was very careful copying during that period and exactly. little to no reason to question that copying. Is that fair? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the book, we, we talk about this Ashkar Gielsen manuscript, which preserves Exodus 14 and 15 and, and maybe a little bit more on either side. But why that's important is Exodus 15 is Moses' song by the sea. Mm. And, uh, and it's actually copied in this elaborate poetic layout that the, that the Jewish Talmud actually prescribed a few centuries earlier, you see. But we just had no examples of say Exodus 15 from this silent period up until really uh, a few years ago, okay? When scholars discovered this, this copy of the Torah scroll that contained Exodus 15 on it. And all of a sudden we realized Jews really were copying the text according to how earlier Jews in the Talmud said they should copy it, you see. So we always had kind of an argument from silence, which is maybe what your dad was working with in those days, you know. Sure. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But now we can start to fill in this picture of how the text throughout the Middle Ages was being copied. Okay. okay. And uh, the only thing I would want to just correct, and we, there's no way they destroy a manuscript after a few errors. What they may do is retire it. They may Got put it, it in this Geniza, if that helps. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I get, and I'm not saying this is not on your dad at all, uh, but, but when, when Dr. Gurry and I go around doing these scribes and scripture conferences, I do ask every audience, have you ever read or heard that when a Jewish scribe made a mistake in copying, that they would destroy that copy and start mm -hmm. over again? And I mean, a good half of the room raises their mm. hands like they that's that's some misinformation that is out there and even in this strict copying period we don't get anything like that so um and you just have to think about it just for a few minutes how many animal skins it takes to create a sound writing surface i mean to write to copy the book of isaiah alone is something like 20 animal skins okay wow. just to do isaiah so it's just it's a material nightmare to copy all of that. So they're not going to lightly uh, destroy that material. So that, that makes sense. Well, I appreciate that you and Peter in particular push back on the way we've done apologetics and say, hey, let's shore some things up. Let's get even more accurate, make a better case. That is yes. always, always welcome. And I appreciate you guys are doing that. So we talked about the Masoretic period, roughly ninth century to maybe 1200s and possibly beyond. Yep. The silent period, the third to the eighth centuries, and the silent period starts when the Dead Sea Scrolls are no longer being made in like the mid second century, so to speak. That's right. That's this right. This is a massive conversation, but in terms of a 30,000 foot view, how do they contribute to our understanding of the copying of the text? Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. So I just want to put all the Dead Sea Scrolls into two big buckets, okay? There's, there's the bucket of conservative copying, okay. those manuscripts that reflect the earliest stage of this period that we've been talking about. Again, scholars are still comfortable, for the most part, talking about proto-Masoretic text manuscripts at, at a, even a place like Qumran. Okay, where the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered. And so, um, so, so from Qumran even, there are texts like 1Q Isaiah B. Okay, so it's a famous Dead Sea Scroll of the book of Isaiah. But scholars look at 1Q Isaiah B and say, wow, this is, this is like the, the prototype for the later Masoretic copy of the book of Isaiah, right? that predates the Masoretic text by a thousand years. Do you see what I mean? And, and the reason they, they say that about 1Q Isaiah B is that the scribe there, he, he, doesn't even, he, he doesn't even use vowel letters, consonants that could be used as vowels. He doesn't even use those. He just, he just transmits this strict consonantal hmm. text without any updating at all. Okay, it's amazing. So, so if you look at that text, a text like that, you go, wow, that is conservative copying. And that's the base text for all those later copies of Isaiah all the way up to the Masoretes, you see. 
Okay, so so that's a, an example of conservative copying from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, let me but let me then, jump in. Bef- let me jump oh, in go before ahead. we yeah. move to the second one. So this is a standard example used by apologists to say one thousand years roughly of transmission, nearly identical and just copied with utter faithfulness. That's yes. a standard example, especially in terms of how important Isaiah is. For sure. Okay. Let, all right. All right. You've pushed me to it, Sean. So <laughs> just kidding. So, so, all right. I think what happened is 1Q Isaiah B, even 1Q Isaiah A, that's the great Isaiah scroll that we talk about. Okay. Those happen to be some of the first scrolls discovered at Qumran back in 1947 and the early 50s. What happened is early Christian apologists, and even to be fair, early scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls started to talk about exact copying, okay? Mm -hmm. Or at least near exact copying of the book of Isaiah from the 1950s, all, you know, uh, that's that was the narrative. I think what happened is, and I actually did some research on this using, um, uh, I guess I can name names here, Geisler and Nix uh, on the history of the Bible or something like, I can't remember the exact title of that book, but it's gone through several editions. The earliest edition of Geisler and Nix actually talks just like Miller Burroughs of the who oh, was like on the first team of discover uh, of archaeologists discovering the the Dead Sea Scrolls in the fifties. That 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 they ain't the the near exact copying of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The problem is is that more and more Dead Sea Scrolls became discovered. Mm. Okay, through the sixties and through the seventies and even through the eighties, and our apologetics manuals were never being updated on gotcha. the picture of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the earliest discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls just so happened to confirm the later Masoretic text. But later discoveries did not fit the picture so neatly, okay? And that's where I think the problem okay. has surfaced. So what's helpful about this is it's not that Geisler and Nix got it wrong in terms of how close that book is right. Uh, right. Uh, over that thousand-year period. And that's it right. makes sense that it's 1Q, Q for Qumran, Cave 1, um, yep. A and B representing two Isaiah scrolls that are discovered. I've actually walked up into that very cave where it was yeah. discovered, which is kind of cool in person. It's amazing. So it's not that that was wrong. It just wasn't the complete story. And That's then right. later we come, for example, Jeremiah that we'll talk about, and there's right. lots of differences. Then yep. it's jarring to people because they've been told that the Dead yep. Sea Scrolls are exactly like the Masoretic text. Exactly. That's okay. exactly the issue. Yeah. So, um, so to me, um, it's just an incomplete picture, but it's an example of convenience where you sort of latch on to that convenient truth early on, and then mm. you, you just cease to update uh, as you go. Where, in fact, I actually think the, an updated picture does show more of a mixed copying. So, so maybe I should move to the second mode of copying yeah. that we talk about. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so very briefly, uh, scribes, again, they did copy conservative, like, conservatively like we've been talking about, but they also copied freely. That is, they, they felt that there were times that they could intervene more okay, in the copying process. And this might put some of the listeners on edge, but I think, I think we'd understand this, though. We, we actually understand this principle because for some reason, as English Bible readers, we're okay with multiple English translations. In fact, hmm. we... We love it, actually. I mean, everything from the ESV, the Amplified Bible, the Message, uh, to to even like things like the Precious Moments Bible. You know, I mean, you know, to give away on to, to to someone's you know on their infant baptism or whatever. You know what I mean? Like there's there's like all kinds of English translations that serve particular functions in our English speaking churches. Okay, so when we go back to Qumran, though. For some reason, we tend to get very, very judgmental if it's not just one text mm. <laughs> and serving one function or something like this. And I think we should stop that. What, 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 what we can learn from this is that ancient Jewish scribes at a place like Qumran were being faithful 
They were being faithful when they copied texts conservatively, letter by letter. They were also being faithful when they copied texts in a way that their original audience could understand. Like, the fact of the matter is that some Hebrew words in our manuscripts copied uh, over the centuries and millennia had simply fallen out of use, and, and later Jewish communities couldn't understand what they meant. Okay, mm. for example, and so sometimes a scribe will update the word choice. Like he he might recognize the archaic word and just say, "Well, you know what? Let's use a more let's use a more contemporary one, so that our our listeners can understand like what's Got going it. on." Does that make sense? So so yeah. there are updatings like this. Now there are other updatings that probably are a bit more challenging. Like we talk about this one in the book too. The, uh, the Ten Commandments. Don't mess with my Ten Commandments. They were etched in stone. You should never change these. They were etched in stone by the finger, the of, finger God. of God. finger of God, right. The finger of God. <laughs> what scribe would be crazy enough to tamper with these? Well, it turns out <laughs> that there was such a scribe that thought, let's, let's modify the Ten Commandments. And there's a scroll from the fourth cave at Qumran, Deuteronomy, N, okay, because there are multiple scrolls of Deuteronomy. So 4Q Deuteronomy N is a scroll of the Ten Commandments, primarily from Deuteronomy 5. And when he gets to the Sabbath commandment, Sean, he, um, he gives the commandment like we would recognize from Deuteronomy 5, but then he also needs to give the rationale for keeping the commandment from Exodus 20, verse 11. And he just inserts that whole verse right into his copying. Yeah. Now, why would a scribe do this? I, I think he's just simply trying to say, there's a Sabbath command we must keep, but there are two good reasons to, for doing it. There's one, God rescued us out of Egypt. That's the Deuteronomy reason. And then in Exodus 20, God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. And that's another good reason. A setting in which you might do that, bring that harmonization in, is liturgy. When you're reading this text out loud in a synagogue way, you might say, oh, he, we need to make sure we have God's one voice, for, so to speak, for why we should keep the Sabbath, you know, here and now. And so a scribe will simply harmonize and bring both of those reasons mm -hmm. together. What we can tell, though, from this, it's a one-off, right? 4Q Deuteronomy N, never copied again. Nothing at all looks like it. Okay, in the in the stream of copying of the of the De of the De uh, Ten Commandments, but we can tell that the scribe actually used a proto masoretic text, like text, mm. a conservatively copied text, a mm. standardized text, and then makes his changes based on that. And so I think we're starting to learn that there must be a mm. standard text in place for creative scribes to actually work from and to work with. So even the most wild of copies coming out of Qumran actually indirectly attest this more standard conservative text that we talked about mm. earlier, you see. Yeah. Okay. So anyhow, that's, that's how I might answer some of those types of questions. Yeah. So let me ask you one more on this, and then we'll shift to canonization. Is yeah. the script that came up after Isaiah on the manuscript on Jeremiah? And when you compare yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls with either, I'm not sure if it's this something to Septuagint, their Masoretic text, their significant difference in length. Mm -hmm. How do we make sense of that? Because that's a very different copy than Isaiah, and they're both big time prophets. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So great question with the Jeremiah one. I'm just going to say first of all, the jury's out. But here's here's mm. how I think the main here are the main lines of argument. First of all. Um, there's not a lot of Dead Sea Scroll evidence for, for Jeremiah. Okay, there's some. Okay. Uh, but let's just start there. This problem is mainly, um, uh, is mainly brought to the fore because a Greek translation known as the Septuagint of Jeremiah it happens to be about one-seventh, one-eighth shorter than our Hebrew Masoretic text. Okay. Uh, and so... Scholars have actually known about this problem for a very long time, mm. okay, because it was, it was already ensconced in the Septuagint. Uh, now, what they think has happened is a very sl a sliver of a manuscript known as 4Q Jeremiah B uh, 
simply ha ha happens to ha uh, maybe show the shorter Hebrew text that okay. the Septuagint was based on. Okay, but but I just listeners need to be aware not a lot of Hebrew evidence for the shorter version. Okay, the the argument is mainly based on the Septuagint. Okay. Okay. But let's sense. for let's for the minute just for the sake of argument say that the Septuagint translator of Jeremiah did translate a shorter Hebrew text. What would that tell us? Well, scholars are are saying this that maybe that represents the earliest the more original version of Jeremiah and the Masoretic text version uh reflects uh, a much later time period of copying that book. And it actually reflects a lot of updating, okay, to give us the form of that book that we have now. Much of it is date formulae. Like, you know how when you're reading a, a prophetic book, oftentimes the book will tell you, like, what uh, year of a king's reign, in mm -hmm. what month, in what day an oracle was given, you know? Well, those are a lot of those are lacking from the, the Septuagint version of Jeremiah but they're found in the Masoretic text version, and that's why they're in our English translations. What that, what that shows scholars is maybe we're looking at a, a, a more polished version of the book, hmm. but I'm not so convinced, and not all scholars are convinced that the MT has to be the later version. And I'll say this, this is, this is I think the key point. Most, most scholars who say the MT is later want to say it's centuries later after okay. Jeremiah. Okay, so so even Maccabean period or something like this, that I don't think there's consensus on that though. I, I think that's the most radical version of this. One 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 hypothesis I want to tease out, or at least get some well-meaning student, innocent student for me to tease out, <laughs> is is think about Jeremiah's life. Think about the narrative about Jeremiah in the Bible itself. He's one of the few prophets that ministers in multiple locations, isn't he? Mm. Uh, so he, he ministers in the land, he survives the exile. Rather than going into Babylon, he winds up in Egypt of all places. And we also know from his ministry in, uh, in the land of Israel, he is sending out letters with his oracles to Babylon. So we actually, can piece together three different locations that writings of Jeremiah would have appeared. Babylon, the land of Israel, and also the land of Egypt. It's the only book which, which obviously points to an amanuensis, right? Someone else writing things down for him. He has a scribe named Baruch. Hmm. And we are told that Baruch writes down many of the oracles of Jeremiah. In other words, the textual history of Jeremiah is complex. But the actual history about Jeremiah, his ministry, and his life is also one of the more complex that we read about. And so That's I just want to think that there's at least a correlation there, you know. And mm -hmm. um, but we need we need more work done uh, on this problem. I would say it's just not it's not finished uh, in any way. Well, yeah. maybe instead of a doctoral student, you could just ask Chat GPT and get an answer right there. Save you some time. Um, it's tempting, isn't <laughs> oh, it? Oh, brother. So new, brave new world. <laughs> let me just clarify, and then we'll move on to canonicity. This yeah. is not super jarring to me because I don't think the Bible fell out of heaven, the Old Testament, in English. It's right. not super jarring because I don't think all the Old Testament was necessarily copied in the way that Isaiah was, although that is a powerful piece of evidence. Indeed. It's the other thing is what's at stake with Jeremiah is not some radically new theology that differs between the young and the uh, and the older or the long and the shorter version. There's just certain details surrounding the larger agreement between these texts. So Correct. to me, it's just less jarring. Is that how you look at it? Is that fair to you? Yeah, I, I do. Okay. Um, yeah. In the book, you know. We, we try to walk through like what is theologically significant, what might just be more significant to how we read a certain narrative, you know, so trying to take differences into account, even as we're exegeting stories. Um, we don't need to go into it here because I think we covered it last sure. time I was on, but but the height of Goliath, right? No matter yeah. how you come out on the on the answer to that question, yep. it doesn't affect the theology of anything one bit, it, but it will affect how we read that story.
right? Okay. And then okay. Uh, one problem we also go into is um, Isaiah 53, 11, does the suffering servant see light? Mm. As many Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint uh, uh, have. Or is it like my ESV English translation, which is my preferred translation, which just simply has he will see, mm. semicolon, he, and be satisfied. Okay, so which is it? All right, and this does affect theology, but yeah. not like the but not the bottom line of theology. So mm. let, let me let me briefly lay out what it, when, it's, when it says that the servant will see light. That servant in that poem in that fourth servant song has already said to have died in verse eight, and he was buried in verse nine. So for him to see light in verse 11 would point to his resurrection. When you, yeah. when you go down into Sheol or the realm of the dead in the ancient world, you go to a very dark place and you never come back up to see the light of day again. Okay. But in Isaiah 53, 11, we have a servant who was dead, buried, and now is said to see light, which would point to a resurrection, you see. Mm -hmm. And so it, but now I want to be clear though, still, I, I think that's important in terms of a prediction of what the suffering servant and the Messiah will go through. Yes. But do I need Isaiah 53, 11 to establish the doctrine of the resurrection? Yeah. Yeah, not really, because <laughs> the New Testament, right, fills that in. But it's, it's, it's one of these, these uh, themes that Dr. Gary and I like to talk about, and that is Scripture is just so repetitive on the, its most essential doctrines, isn't it? And so the resurrection is already repeated quite a number of places in Scripture. But this would be a very early prediction and reference, I would say, to the, the Messiah being resurrected from the dead, I would say. Yeah. In one of the most important texts from Isaiah in right. the Old Testament in terms of right. prophecy. So Absolutely. really quickly, do you, you think it said, you like the ESV, but you think the ESV probably got it wrong here, and you would say it did see the light in Isaiah 53, oh, yeah. 11. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, the external evidence uh, of three different Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And again, at Qumran, right, as we kind of talked about, there wasn't really yep. a— there wasn't really a, 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 an emphasis on making sure a text harmonized. There's just simply three different copies that contain the word light because okay. that's what was in the scribe's text. And then the Septuagint translated a, a Hebrew copy of Isaiah down in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, also containing the word light. So, yeah, I, I just think this is the, the original reading based on the external evidence alone. Mm. Yeah. So let's shift to canonization. Uh, what is the first canon list? And by canon, we mean kind of the standard or read of official books of the Old Testament. Where's the first time we see a list mentioned, historically speaking, and what do you think it tells us? Yeah, right. So the first, the first canon list, um, a list of authoritative books, okay? Uh, it occurs um, in the, uh, a text— um, from Melito of Sardis, a bishop in uh, Western Turkey. Okay, uh, Eusebius, the church historian, is the one that preserves this text for us. Should be clear about mm -hmm. that. But he is telling us about uh, a story from a second century bishop around 170 AD who was a little bit uh, exercised, let's say, about what the books of the Old Testament were and what was their correct order, incidentally. And he talks about how he's going to go back to the land of Israel, uh, the, where, where the fathers were at. And he's going to uh, he's going to gain this information. He's going to learn from them about what the canon of the Old Testament was. And so, yeah, that's the earliest list of books uh, for the Old Testament. And from it, we gain that early Christians uh, were still not listing what we might call apocryphal books or deuterocanonical books, uh, but rather their, their canon was closely reflecting the Hebrew or the Jewish canon uh, of books. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. That's what we yeah, learned that, from the earliest list. That does. Now, sometimes I've seen scholars point towards statements in the New Testament, like in, of course, Matthew 5, the reference to the law and the prophets being Scripture. Now, of course, that raised the question, what is the law— exactly yes. the prophets or 
in Luke eleven fifty one from Abel, which would be in Genesis to Zechariah, one of the right. later prophets. Do yep. these help confirm the books of the Old Testament, or are they too nebulous to you? Yeah, okay. We we do mention these little ancient these ancient notices or ancient statements in the book, Law and the Prophets. I think it's pretty clear law never changes. It's the books written by Moses, mm. those five books. Uh, there, there's no reason to doubt that. Uh, but prophets has has been a, a continued point of uh, of uh, of trouble trying to nail it down. So so you you get two options like. Pro basically, the law can refer to Mosaic books, and prophets just refers to any scriptural book that's mm -hmm. non-Mosaic, right? Now, if you're John Barton, right, that's, that's the answer to that question, and that means prophets could encompass books outside of what became the prophets. Does that make sense? Like, so in other words, you could, yeah. you could encompass a book like Enoch under a definition like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you could encompass... Uh, a book like Judith or Tobit under a definition like that. Okay. Um, some have just said, no, 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 no. Law and prophets has always been an umbrella term, which refers to books that really were finally recognized in the canon. Like they, scholars like uh, Steinberg and Stone simply say, well, it's, a, it's this umbrella term that never ever is applied to a book that wasn't finally received in the canon. Okay. okay. So... I think more work needs to be done. But my quick answer, Sean, is I don't find these references that helpful. Oh, because okay. Just, just okay. because people are going to continually go back and forth as to what books were intended under this banner of the prophets. Mm. Does that make sense? Even, yep. ev even Matthew 24 is going to cause problems because Daniel – is by Jesus is called a prophet. Okay. But but in the Jewish uh, categorization of of canonical books, Daniel is actually not included in the prophets. Daniel mm. is included in what is called the writings. Okay. Interesting. And so and so so there's just going to be too many issues there. And and interestingly enough, mm. uh, Jewish writings also record Solomon as a prophet. David is a prophet. Even Acts mm. chapter 2 calls David a prophet. Okay. So, so, but we would tend to put the books of Psalms, the books of Solomon, right? As Jews later did, they, they got included in the writings. They weren't included in the prophets. So anyhow, there, there, there's difficulties with this. So in the book, we take a, t a different tact. We actually want to know what specific books were being called scripture and were being um, evaluated or estimated as having inviolable authority. Do mm. you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when you take the Dead Sea Scrolls, what evidence of quotations they give, and you take the quotations of Philo of Alexandria, again, famous Jewish philosopher who basically read the Old Testament through Platonic I, eyes, you know, uh, and then you take the statements in the New Testament, right? Which books are quoted as just as it has been written or scripture says. When you put all that together, you actually get a pretty strong core canon, okay? Uh, the law, the prophets, uh, many of the writings like Psalms, Proverbs, Job, uh, some of the historical books, all quoted as scripture when you put all of these sources together. But you're still going to wind up with some holes like was Ecclesiastes thought of as mm. having inviolable authority? Was mm. the Song of Songs thought th of that way? Uh, and then, of course, Esther. That's that's my favorite one. Okay. Mm. So so uh, what are we gonna so so what are we gonna do with those? But still, what I want to say is, by the time of Jesus, we have evidence, not not up to whatever's in the Law and the Prophets and whatever that might include. We have sound and solid evidence of a core canon before and during the time of Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, it does. Uh, to, to, to the point, Sean, let's just go right to the point. In Matthew 19, both the Pharisees and Jesus believe that the scriptures contain the answer to their question about marriage and divorce. Mm. 
right? They, they are, both sides are completely convinced that the scriptures contain the answer. That shows me there's a generally agreed upon core collection of scriptures that all sides can appeal to in settling matters of doctrine and dispute. I think that's, mm. yeah, I think that's really helpful to point out here. So, and we can piece that, that history together. So, um, I've lost yeah. track what the question was now, Sean. No, no, that was, the, <laughs> that, that's perfect. So like you cite Matthew 19, the question about marriage, Jesus yeah. references Genesis one and Genesis two. And you could say, well, yes. it's only Genesis. It's the law. It's the entire yep. Old Testament. Now Jesus refers to other passages and characters in the Old Testament. We could start to piece together which ones he refers sure. to. So For bottom sure. line, there's an, a core agreement about the ones in early Christianity, early Judaism, even though there's a few on the fringes that's not solidified. Exactly. That's okay. Right. So that brings us to a question I've been wanting to ask you that you said really at the beginning – in terms of, I can't remember if you said your grandma or your aunt who had a Roman Catholic Bible that right. includes a different or additional number of books that would be considered authoritative and inspired. Even mm -hmm. just on the Old Testament, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Protestant, three yes. of the big branches of broad historic Christianity, have different lists of Old Testament books John, I can hear my skeptic friends saying, you Christians can't even agree on what books are inspired, let alone what they say. <laughs> what would your response be as a Protestant to that difference? The way I answer this question about why the church has different canons is I start in the fourth century talking about two prominent figures named Jerome and Augustine. Now, Augustine is, again, my homeboy on so many matters theological, uh, just super critical, just crucial figure uh, for helping me think through, say, God's sovereignty, human's responsibility, these sorts of things. But Augustine uh, uh, reports on a canon of the Old Testament that includes six extra books, uh, if you're a Protestant. It includes the books of Tobit, Judith, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, and first and second Maccabees. Okay, so all books that a Protestant would not include in the canon, but the Roman Catholic Church includes. So the question is, what what, what happened? But, but before I get there, let me let me back up. Jerome, Jerome held to a canon criterion which required only books of the Hebrew canon mm. to be included, which caused him to eliminate or excise those other books. So so the, the clash over the canon happened in the fourth century. And what's going on here is I think in North Africa, Augustine, for whatever reason, adopted a criterion that said whatever the church finds useful, whatever the church finds edifying, and whatever the church reads and accepts, that should be in our canon. So those two different criteria are going to lead to two different canons, but the matter is never sorted out by Jerome and Augustine. And throughout, really, Sean, through the entire Middle Ages, those two views on the canon are kind of kept side by side with no significant advance on either side. Hmm. Now, fast forward to the 16th century with the period of the Reformation. And here, we, there's just a, there's a spirit of the age causing church theologians, scholars of the church like Erasmus, you know, Cardinal Cajetan, Cardinal Jimenez, who, who, who all three of those men just super responsible for uh, the scholarship coming out from the church in the early decades of the 1500s, okay? But they're not Protestants, they're, they're Catholics, but they have a, they ha they've imbibed the spirit of going back to the sources, okay? And interestingly enough, all three of those men actually would have sided with Jerome and his canon, hmm. limited by the Hebrew canon, you see. And so they were very clear that books like Judith and Tobit uh, are not going to be afforded the same amount of weight, so to speak, as a book like Genesis. Okay, just wasn't, that's not how they, uh, they, they were not thinking in terms of Tobit and Judith on the same level, okay? But you know, and your listeners probably know what happened at the Council of Trent, okay, in 1546. The, there was a, a, a gathering of, of Catholics 
and uh, of theologians, and eventually they decided on a decree of a of a, a canon list that included all of those books in the canon and even gave it official decretal status by including what's known as an anathema or an accursed statement. If you don't hold to this list of books in and those books in their textual form in the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, okay, then let that person be accursed. Okay. Mm. So that's actually the first time in the entire history of the canon that such a, a, a fierce and strong statement was made, okay, but to, against the person who wouldn't accept that list of books. Now, in the book, we also talk about there's a lot of history going on on, on Trent. And interestingly, behind the scenes, behind that decree, there, we, we now know numerous theologians were disagreeing on this matter. In fact, the vote was something like, I don't know, there were only about like 15 or 20 for it. And there were like, you know, 13, 12 against that statement. Okay. So we actually know about the vote. Hmm. Uh, and the other thing we know is that there were certain theologians in tr at Trent who were saying, look, are we really, are we really saying that we're going to decide between that long standing debate between Jerome and Augustine? Like, who are we to do that? And so what's interesting is like, like, like theologians name is like this Banuccio, he comes to mind. He makes statements like this, and you would think that he was a Protestant, but he's not. He's actually, he's actually a Catholic theologian at Trent, but basically saying, whatever we do here, we need to make sure we're not deciding between the differences in the canon. Well, anyhow, the decree comes out so bald and so general that now there people are to only conclude that they were making a decision between these things. Mm. And uh, so one Roman Catholic historian today, John O'Malley, puts it this way. Look, whatever the prelates thought they were doing, the actual wording of the decree decides in favor of Augustine. And so actually, the, mis the misunderstanding is to be laid at the feet of Trent is what O'Malley says, <laughs> because, because they actually had a, a quite an academic debate behind the scenes, but the decree is so bald and, uh, and so kind of one-sided that it doesn't reflect at all the debate between the prelates at the council itself. So all that to say, Trent has given us two different canons, okay, mm -hmm. in the final math of this. And Protestants continue to decide or, or, or to side with the older Catholic scholars like Erasmus, like Cajetan, like Himenes, and they all decided to go with really with Jerome at the end of the day. We're with the Hebrew canon. The other books can be read. This may be surprising too, Sean. Yeah. Protestants didn't reject books like Tobit and Judas saying never read them. They actually never said that. Uh, in fact, all the earliest Protestant confessions have a place for the Apocrypha. They actually say they're good and necessary or good and useful to read is what they say. So not equal to scripture, but they are good and useful to read. And by that, they're also echoing Jerome, who said these books were for edification, mm -hmm. not for the establishing of church doctrine, you see. So I don't know about you, but I've been a Protestant my whole life. And I'm, I'm, anytime I engage this conversation with Roman Catholics, I'm always accused of being part of a tradition that takes books out of the Bible every time. Mm. That's the way it is framed. And yet, I think, I think what we could actually say is that Protestants are on the side of the Hebrew canon, which is the oldest standing canon, and it's the oldest representation of the Old Testament canon, like from Melito of Sardis that we looked at earlier. So Jerome is actually right. Jerome has the earliest tradition on his side, which then, which then means Protestants are right, because they have the longest standing tradition on their side as well. To get to Trent is because you're trapped in a conciliar kind of thinking, which would take more time to explain here than we have. Sure, sure. Um, but, but let me just quickly address Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay. How would we, how would we unravel the history of the, of the canon of Eastern Orthodoxy? I do actually take the time to read modern Eastern Orthodox scholars on the canon. They, it's tricky because they, um, they, they eventually end up concluding that there's no way to talk about a closed canon oh. of scripture. 
Yeah. So mm -hmm. Eugene Pentiuk, for example, in his uh, OUP monograph from 2014, I think. I mean, he. It, it's so it's nebulous, uh, it, and I don't, I don't, I'm trying not to mean that pejoratively. I, I think it's meant to be amorphous because of the delicate ways in which they say uh, tradition interplays with the the, the uh, contemporary working of the spirit. You see, within Eastern Orthodoxy, it allows them to leave open massive questions about, say, whether the book of Revelation or not is included in the canon still, okay? Uh, or whether a book like Third Maccabees, Third Maccabees, okay, should be included, okay? Third Maccabees is included in Eastern Orthodox study Bibles, hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean they think it's canon, okay? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, and and again, I'm not trying to be pejorative because it it, it sure. it's tied to a whole system of thought of uh, there. But I will say this: from what I can gather, the Russian Orthodox branch of East, Eastern Orthodoxy, in their catechism, they go back to these church fathers that I'm very familiar with: Athanasius of Alexandria, Gregory of Nazianzus, Cyril of Jerusalem. All fourth century church fathers, all of them talk about a closed canon. <laughs> <laughs> like so so when you actually go back to the earliest greek fathers of the church they're saying don't expect more revelation this is it this is these books are all that you need okay athanasius goes so far as to say that these canonical books are the springs of salvation sean it's a soteriological point for athanasius in other words you're, the, the matter of eternal destinies is in wrapped is wrapped up in these canonical books, interestingly enough. And so it's not just an academic question. So the sure. Russian Orthodox do go back to these earliest fathers to say, no, 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 these, this is the canon, and, and it is closed. So all that to say there's some disagreement about how you yeah. might unravel the canon in Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah. So two things. One, at some point it'd be interesting if you knew the right Orthodox scholar, the right Catholic scholar, come on, not a debate. But just clarify, right. here's how we make sense of this. Here's how right. we respond to the differences, just so people could understand. That'd be a fascinating conversation. Let's explore that in due time. As an apologist, my quick response when people ask this is say, look, that's fair. There's some differences. But keep in mind there is agreement on the 39 Old Testament books across. Exactly. The question is exactly. what else do we add? And the yep. heart of the Old Testament is there nonetheless. That's, That's right. That's my quick response. That's right. John, I got a million more questions for you, which just gives us ex an excuse to do this again. <laughs> Let's but do it. Enjoy your book, Scribes and Scripture. I'd say to a skeptic who wants to start with saying, how's the Bible put together? A great place to start, although I think you're writing primarily to Christians to say, what is the Bible? How's it put together? How's it copied? Can we trust it? It's kind of a 101 to this. That's understandable. Right. And interesting. So appreciate what you and your colleague Peter Gurry do. He's been on the show at least a couple times at the uh, Canon Institute. You guys work at is fantastic. So appreciate you coming on. And then for those of you watching, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got other shows coming up on the Bible, apologetics, culture. You won't want to miss. And if you thought about studying apologetics, join me at Biola University, 39 units, uh, top rated for apologetics, fully distance program. And I would love to have you consider that. There's information below. And we also have a certificate program that is back up right now. And there's actually a significant discount below. You can plug in online. We have people that will walk you through kind of just getting certified in the basics of apologetics. John, super appreciate you. Thanks for your great work. Uh, let's do it again soon. Thanks, Sean.